You are listening to the Foundry Church Podcast. If you'd like to know more about us, visit www.foundrychurch.net. Hey friends, welcome to the Foundry Church. We're so glad you're here with us today. We're going to dive into our teaching. Um, The other night, Erica and I were watching TV, and it was like 11.30 at night. Uh, We're a bit of night owls. We we stay up later because I don't like mornings, but I still have to have them because I have kids. But that's not why we're talking today. So we're, we're getting ready to lay down in bed. We kick on the TV just to see what's going on in the world, and Rudy's on. Now, I don't know about you, but when Rudy's on, I watch, right? And um, you, you may not know this, but Eric is a huge sports movie junkie, and uh, she loves it too. So we're laying there watching Rudy, and, um, and we watch it, and it's just this story of this indomitable human spirit, this kid who comes out of like, you know, the, it, it looked like his dad worked in uh, like the, the foundries of Gary, Indiana and stuff like that. And he had this dream of, of being at Notre Dame, of going to Notre Dame, and then being able to be on the football team at Notre Dame. And you watch this story as he sleeps in janitor's closets. He works four semester or yeah, four semesters to um, try to get into Notre Dame. And, and be an undergrad student there, and then his, his journey through being on the practice squad. And at the end of the movie, there's this scene where Rudy, his teammates have seen him give of himself time and again, and it's just this, this spirit, this will to do it. He's going to do it, and he's this undersized, unathletic um, kid, and all he has is heart. All he has is his drive and the will to succeed. And he gets in and he makes a tackle in the last last play of the game. I think it was against Georgia Tech. He's the last player to be carried out of the Golden Domers um, on the you know carried out by the other players. It's this magical moment, and everybody's like Rudy, Rudy, you know. And you're just sitting there, and you're like, this is magic, and you're like crying. And maybe if you're not crying, that's on you. So you need to have your heart checked if you're not crying at that moment. But um, so. So, so after the movie's over, it's like it's like right around one when the movie ended, and so it's like, well, tomorrow morning's going to be all right, and um, we roll over to go to sleep, and all of a sudden I hear Erica go, Erica, Erica. I'm like, what are you doing? She's like, I was just motivating myself. Like she was, all, and I'm like, were you chanting Rudy for yourself? She's like, yeah, but it was the weirdest thing because you know you're in between sleep, and all of a sudden, like a penguin goes dancing by, and you're like, I'm falling asleep, and then I hear the chant, Erica, right? And you hear these things of these people, these stories, the Louis Zamperinis, the unbroken guy, the people who have this indomitable human spirit. And they're going to attend to the thing they set their mind on. It could be survival. It could be playing for Notre Dame. But they set their heart and their mind to it, and they won't be deterred. They'll sacrifice everything for it. And I think that's an important thing that we talk about and understand this this spirit of well, of us, we have as a human a, a spirit, a spirit to live, a spirit to achieve, and it's a wonderful thing. It's a wonderful thing, and God uses it in powerful ways. And we're going to talk today out of Acts 2, 42, where it says the early church devoted itself to the apostles' teaching, the fellowship, breaking of bread, and prayer. They, they really dialed in on those four things. And today we're going to look at the apostles' teaching. We're going to look at the apostles' teaching and get a grip on what is going on when they say the apostles' teaching, because we could say, well, we don't have the apostles' teaching. We don't have, we don't know what they taught on. But here's what, we, what I know. I know that when I was young, like, and I don't mean it against education, but I, was, I had a really hard time in school, really hard time. I was colorblind. I still am. Um, and, and I got teased about it in the office the other day. Not a safe place. And... Um, and I'm colorblind, I'm dyslexic, I had an awesome speech impediment. I had a number of things going on, and back in the day, California and Colorado were really, you know, leading the edge on education and diagnosing dyslexia and different things like that, and I got a lot of help. But I do know this, that as I got older, I was always afraid when I walked into a classroom, and I was always skeptical of the teachers, you know, because I was the kid who got in trouble a lot. So basically, I was wondering what kind of hammer is about to fall on me. And um, do you remember, like I do, walking in, and you see that teacher who kind of at first blush, you're like, 
I'd like to invite you to 18 weeks of the worst of my life. You know, you kind of feel that way, and it's not that they're bad. You just, maybe they just kind of look a little weird. Maybe um, maybe they were teaching a subject you didn't like. They seemed like someone you're not going to love or get along with, and then by the end of the semester, you're like holding on to them. You're like, because <laughs> you love them. You're like, I don't want to leave. You're so safe, and you're so good. And you're like, why? Why? Why were they your favorite? What made them your all-time favorite and made you love them? And it's because they got you interested, maybe like history, by bringing it alive. Somehow they made you think, they made you feel and understand the material and its greater purpose beyond a classroom. You could see it and they were the vehicle that got you there and they made it relatable and then they kind of knew you. They called you by a name or a nickname and you just felt this bond with this teacher, someone who would teach you things that you would use beyond the, the walls of the classroom. What they taught you had a practical, emotional, and it felt like to your own human spirit an impact on what you believe is your purpose in life. There's some teachers that came out in the first church uh, that came out um, like loudly and missionally. We look at Peter, John, Thomas, James, Matthias, James the Lesser, did you know one of the disciples is James the Lesser? So in case there's a pecking order in Scripture, there's literally the name James the Lesser. I guess, you know, rank does matter. Um, there's Judas, not Iscariot, but the other one. And um, these disciples were filled with the Holy Spirit. They were equipped to bring the gospel to life in the world around them. They were equipped to teach the gospel in the world around them. But we need to understand that um, they were common, everyday, ordinary men. They would have been like that teacher you look at and go, yeah, there's not much to them. But deep down, there was a drive in them. There was a sense of purpose and identity. I want you to join me in Acts chapter 5 as we read about the passion the apostles had for teaching the word of God. It says this. Acts chapter 5, verse 17. We're going to read all the way to 42. may take a minute, but I invite you, find yourself in this story. Get on the dusty roads and walk with them. Check it out. Then the high priest, priest and all his associates, who were members of the um, party of the Sadducees, were filled with jealousy after the apostles had healed many people. They were filled with jealousy. They arrested the apostles. They put them in the jail. But during the night, an angel of the Lord opened the doors of the jail and brought them out. Go stand in the temple courts, he said, and tell the people all about this new life. Teach them. Teach them about this new life. At daybreak, the apostles entered the temple courts, as they had been told, and they began to teach the people. When the high priest and his associates arrived, apparently they arrived a little later in the day, not judging, I'm not a morning person either, but um, the full assembly of the elders of Israel, um, and they sent, well, I'm sorry, they called together the Sanhedrin and the full assembly of the elders of Israel, and they sent to the jail for the apostles. Go get the apostles, we're gonna deal with them. But on arriving at the jail, the officers did not find them there. So, they went back and reported, we found the jail securely locked with the guards standing outside the doors. But when we opened them, we found no one inside. On hearing this report, the captain of the temple guard and the chief priest were at a loss, wondering what this might lead to. Then someone came and said, look, the men you put in jail are standing in the temple courts teaching the people. At that, the captain went with his officers and brought the apostles. They did not use force. Because they feared that the people would stone them, throw rocks at them until they died. The apostles were brought in. They were made to appear before the Sanhedrin to be questioned by the high priest. We gave you strict orders not to teach in this name, he said. You have filled Jerusalem with your teaching and are determined to make us guilty of this man, Jesus' blood. Peter and the other apostles replied, we must obey God rather than human beings. The God of our ancestors raised Jesus from the dead, whom you killed. 
by hanging him on a cross. God has exalted him to his own right hand as prince and savior that he might bring Israel to repentance and forgive their sins. We are witnesses of these things and so is the Holy Spirit whom God has given to those who obey him. Oh, that is just, I mean, can you imagine? That is such boldness. When they heard this, they were furious. The Sanhedrin was livid. They wanted to put them to death. But a Pharisee named Gamaliel, a teacher of the law who was honored by all the people, he stood up in the Sanhedrin and he ordered that the men be put outside for a little while. Go outside. We're going to talk about you is what's going to happen. Then he addressed the Sanhedrin and he said this, Men of Israel, consider carefully what you intend to do to these men. Some time ago, Thaddeus appeared claiming to be somebody about 400 men rallied to him. He was killed, all his followers dispersed, and it came to nothing. After him, Judas the Galilean appeared in the days of the census and led a band of people in revolt. He too was killed. And all his followers were scattered. Therefore, in the present case, I advise you, leave these men alone. Let them go. For if their purpose or activity is of human origin, it will fail. But if it is of God, if this is from God, you will not be able to stop these men. You will only find yourself fighting against God. His speech persuaded them. They called the apostles in and they had them flogged. They had them beaten like Jesus was flogged. So it would have been of a horrible thing. And then they ordered them not to speak in the name of Jesus, not to teach in the name of Jesus, and then they let them go. The apostles left the Sanhedrin rejoicing because they had been counted worthy of suffering disgrace for the name of Christ. This verse catches me. Day after day in the temple courts and from house to house, they never stopped teaching or proclaiming the good news that Jesus is the Messiah. When we, I mean, we could spend a year right there in that text. And we could, I mean, I invite you to read that text this at some point and then read John 14 and, and see the parallels to what Jesus told them. It's amazing. So when we talk about the apostles' teaching, the apostles as these unlikely teachers that people will follow, we know this, that the apostles' teaching, that first thing in the four, the four rhythms of the early church, that first thing, the apostles' teaching, it started biblically. In Acts 2, that's where we see the first real teaching of the apostles. That's where we hear it and see it on display. And it revealed that the apostles' teaching is the full word of God. The counsel of God in the whole, the totality of Scripture, the Old and the New Testament, that is the basis, that is the substance of the apostles' teaching. It is not their wisdom. It is the wisdom, counsel, and guidance of God in Scripture here. This is the apostles' teaching. Peter's Pentecost message was 26 verses long. Of those 26 verses, 11 of them were directly quoted out of the Old Testament meaning about, let's do math publicly, 40-ish, 41, 42% of Peter's message was Old Testament. And what it's saying is, don't forget, look back. Look back into the full counsel of God in this end of the book because in here, the Messiah is promised. The, 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 the totality of Jesus' work will be better understand when we see that God was using the Old Testament to reveal to us in this day and age who Jesus was. Peter's Pentecost message was 40-some percent from the Old Testament. The counsel of God in Scripture means we do not leave the Old Testament behind. And I think it's important that we note that the apostles' teaching was guided by the Holy Spirit. It would illuminate and reveal how God would use approximately 35-some authors over 3,000 years to tell one story. That one story is that Jesus was coming. That one story is that Jesus' life, his death, and his resurrection would redeem it all. That's the story of the narrative of Scripture, that God loves us and the fullness of God's love is seen in the person and the promise of Christ in his life, death, and resurrection. 
And we hold on to the apostles' teaching because they held on to the word of God. We can look back to what Jesus said in John 14. It tells us that John 14 is a story where Jesus tells his disciples, there's a part of it where he promises that he will send them the Holy Spirit. The exact quote is that Jesus tells them there is a teacher coming and he will bring all of it to life, like that teacher who brings history to life, and you're like, oh, you just soak it in. Or they make math a living thing, and you feel like, oh, I see the purpose of it. Jesus is saying in John 14, a teacher is coming, and he will breathe life into this message. John 14, verse 15, Jesus says this, if you love me, keep my commandments, and I will ask the Father, and he will give you another advocate to help you and be with you forever, which means this. Remember, the word of Christ has weight to it. He's saying that you don't have to live without the Holy Spirit. I said it last week. Invite the Spirit to fill you continually. Jesus promised that he'll be with us forever. He'll be here. The Spirit of God will lead us and guide us. It goes on to say, it is the Spirit of truth. Like, get this with me. He will give you another advocate. So Jesus has advocated on behalf of your soul. The Spirit of God is advocating on behalf of Christ in your life, which I think is awesome. The Spirit of God is advocating for your life, your present life, to be one that witnesses to Christ. And he advocates for that. And he will be with you forever, and he is the Spirit of truth. There is no darkness. There is no deceit in God. And he is the spirit of truth. He will reveal the truth of God to the world he died to save, which I find that amazing. In John 14, 25, we see this. Jesus says, all this I have spoken while I am still with you. But the advocate, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, will teach you all things and will remind you of everything I have said. I love that line. Have you ever had that moment where you're reminded of something? You're like, oh, Did you know that's quite often, I believe it's the Holy Spirit working in the church, prompting our hearts. When we are sensitive, when we are filled with the Holy Spirit, there are times where he reminds us of the word of God. He reminds us of who we are so we don't step back into that sin. He says, the Spirit will teach you. He is your teacher. He will teach you all things and will remind you of everything I have said, which makes Peter's uh, sermon on Pentecost so much more awesome. It's a spirit-filled, like it's like God is dictating something out of Peter. He's telling the story of Jesus in a way he wasn't trained to, but he could no longer keep it in because the Spirit of God had something to teach. Jesus goes on to say, peace I leave with you. My peace I give to you. Do, I do not give to you as the world gives. So Christ brings us peace, and then he says this, don't let your hearts be troubled, and don't be afraid. And now we see why they'd be afraid. They're in front of the Sanhedrin. They got Jesus crucified. They're flogged. They're beaten. All but one disciple suffered a martyr's death. From India to Spain, the disciples are buried to this very day. It blows my mind. It blows my mind how far they got. But we know this that they believe the word of God. They believe the word of God. The apostles' teaching was, is the word of God. The apostles taught the word of God. They lived in it. And the weight of words is what I think really, this is where it holds for me. The, The apostles who were fishermen, tax collectors, and generally derelicts, people who are not worthy of being in this role, well, They taught the word of God with clarity and authority. And do you remember how they said early in Jesus' ministry, who is this man who teaches like he has authority? And we know that the apostles taught with such authority. Why? Because if we remember, the words of Jesus Christ after his resurrection had weight. Remember the weight of glory, the glorified Christ. So his words, all the fulfillment, it had weight. But guess what's amazing about that? The weight of Jesus' words, Scripture, is conveyed to you and I. It's why hypocrisy in the church is so damaging to those beyond. 
because our words have weight. When we make a claim, when we say we are something and then we're not, our words carry weight. It's why Christians universally are held to an unfairly high standard. Your words have weight. The apostles' words had weight. The Spirit of Christ, the Holy Spirit, gives weight to your words, to your teaching, and your life. Remember, Jesus' words had weight, and he sent an advocate for your life to have impact, to have weight to it. We see it in the apostles. Their their teaching carries weight. The witness of the church carries weight. Teach the gospel at all times when necessary, use words. I love that quote by Assisi, but the reality is that means your living is declaring the word of God. So you know that your living carries weight. What you say, what you do, who you are in public and in private carries weight. The apostles knew the weight of glory because they lived in it. And you and I should be equally familiar with the weight of that glory, that the word of God is supposed to be billboarded out of us. It's supposed to be radiating out of us so that the world can see it. But here's the difference. Courageous obedience, it's one of our values at this church. Courageous obedience is not a concept, it's a lifestyle. It's an active engagement in what God called us to do and God called us to be. This past week in Acts chapter, I think, 8, uh, Philip, the, the apostle Philip, um, he, was, he was obeying the Holy Spirit. Courageous obedience, right? The Spirit sent him down to The lower road, which is down by the Mediterranean, that runs down south towards um, Ethiopia, Egypt, that way, it would have been a trading route. It would have been a Roman road. And he goes down there, and there's an Ethiopian eunuch riding in his chariot. And he's reading one of the ancient texts, the Old Testament. And the Lord prompts him to go run next to his chariot. Now, I don't know about you and me, but if God said, hey, Eric, somebody's going to drive down Main Street today, and I want you to run next to their car, I'm like, I don't have those kind of quicks, God. (laughs) You know, I mean, I've got a good 100 yards in me, and then I need a milk break. But um, but like you think of it, like Philip takes off running, and he runs next to the, um, this is how I run, by the way, apparently. It's like a little choo-choo train, just whoop. But um, he's running next to the, the chariot, and he hears the eunuch, the Ethiopian eunuch, who would have been an official of the queen's court, reading the prophet. And he says, do you understand <laughs> what you're reading? And he said, how can I understand unless someone teaches me? Can I get in? He gets in. He leads the eunuch to Christ. And the eunuch says, what prevents me from being baptized now? And, and Philip said, nothing. So they got out of the chariot at a spring, and he baptized him. And then, this is one of the great parts in the New Testament, the Holy Spirit grabbed Philip and spirited him away. And instantly, like he like, boom, disappeared. And the Ethiopian eunuch's like, oh. And to this day, the Coptic church in Ethiopia thrives because of the witness of Philip. When we look at the weight of it, of courageous obedience, courage to obey, paired with one thing, a love for this. We have to be people who love this. We have to be people who are willing to have the stamina in life to be tired, to be worn out, and to be used by people. And I'll be honest, I get tired of being used sometimes. I'm a human, it hurts my feelings, but the reality is, for the glory of Jesus Christ, we have to understand, if we are courageously obedient and we love the word of God, he will let our life be used by others for one thing, for the glory of Jesus Christ. We have to be people who are courageously obedient. We have to be obedient to be in the apostles' teaching, the word of God, the garments of Christ, the scriptures. You and I can make no excuse No pretense that we don't know the weight of these words. If you're in the Foundry Church, you now know this is the weight you bear. If the Christian life feels some weight to it, good, because you're understanding the Spirit of God is communicating to you the weight your life lives under. It's not always hard. It's actually one of the most joyful things ever. You find yourself proverbially running next to the chariot, doing things that make no sense, why God uses your courageous obedience to reach into the lives of others. It's doing the little things that shock people out of their mundane ordinariness and create in them a curiosity that the Spirit of God wants to feed towards Christ. 
but we have to learn to be courageously obedient. One of the realities I love in courageous obedience is this. We get into conversations all the time where we're, um, where we're, you know, people are asking questions. And if you're, if you're a member of the church, maybe your friends are like, so why do you go to church? And you're like, well, I just go to church because I don't want to go to hell. You know, that's a terrible witnessing tactic, right? You, you get into conversations where you feel overwhelmed. But the fact is that we should be praying all the time. I pray continually when I'm in settings where people are asking me questions or counseling. I'm like, oh, please, Spirit, give me words, give me wisdom. I can't do this. They don't want my advice, right? They, do not, they need none of that. They need you to speak. They need you to speak. So I will tell you this, time in the Word and time with God really, really matters. And His Spirit will take that time in the Word, which you're spending with God when you're in the Word, and He will give you a call, a courageous obedience to live into. The Lord will not leave you idle. He desires to let your life be one of active, verb-based obedience. Not mental obedience, like, yeah, I'll do that one day. But doing it immediately and living into it. The reality for us is this. The disciples taught in the face of fierce opposition. They had been flogged. They had been put on trial. They had been put in jail. And they kept teaching. Never forget these words. Day after day in the temple courts, from house to house, they never stopped teaching and proclaiming the good news that Jesus Christ, this Jesus Christ whom you crucified, is both Lord and Messiah. He is the Savior. They never quit teaching it. And I invite you to an act of courageous obedience, to get into the Word of God on your own, to feed yourself, and to look and realize that you are linked like a chain to these ancient apostles, and we are continuing the witness of Jesus Christ through the lives of broken people. We don't have to be perfect. We need to be spirit-filled, obedient, active, responsive, obedient Christians, courageously living into what God's Word says. Because I'll tell you this, when you have time in the Word, you have time with God. Remember Rudy? We talked about him in the beginning, that, that indomitable human spirit. But that's actually a fallacy. It's, it's not true. The human spirit, well, it does succumb to life. Every one of us dies, right? Louis Zamperini is no longer alive. He was the guy from Unbroken. And in the end, our indomitable human spirit is dominated, and we lose this, this mortal garment. Would you imagine with me just for a moment if we quit believing in the human spirit and we started living according to the power of the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit of Almighty God living in you, living in me. Imagine with me if we were courageous enough to let the Spirit of God burn out of us and be living witnesses to the gospel, not by your power or your will, but because of what the Spirit of God has enlivened in you because of what Jesus Christ brought from the, the dead in you back to life. He brings us back to life. He redeems us, and the Spirit of God empowers us. Don't be people who hold on to your indomitable spirit. Understand this. You are gifted, you are equipped, and you are called to be a person who proclaims the gospel of Jesus, not by your power, but only by his. The Spirit of God living in you, declaring through you the wonders of Christ, the wonders of salvation in a very practical and tangible way to a world around you. Never forget that we are not people who live by our indomitable human spirit. We are people who take our breath and we move forward based on, out of, fueled by the Holy Spirit of God, calling, equipping, gifting, and then calling us to courageous obedience. I ask you today, I'll ask you again, will you obey the Spirit of God's prompting? And in so doing, see the world turn towards the cross. Pray with me. Lord Jesus Christ, thank you for who you are for the way you take your spirit and pour it into our broken lives. And we ask, God, today that you would speak to us, that you would guide us and lead us in such a way 
that people would see the Spirit of God and wonder what it is and be attracted to it, feel, feel called to it, not to us, not to people, but to you. God, please shine through us. We ask as we attend faithfully to the apostles' teaching, the Word of God, the Scriptures, that as we attend to those, that you would open them up to us, that the ink on the pages would literally rub off on us and we would leave our time in the word being visible representatives of the living word of God, that people would see the gospel in everything we do. Even in our brokenness, in our redemption, they would see that they too can be redeemed. Lord Jesus, we love you. We thank you for doing exactly what you promised in John 14 for sending the advocate, for sending the teacher. So as we attend to the word, we ask, come Holy Spirit, teach, invigorate, and enliven us, your church. We wait on you to speak. In Christ's name, amen. Thanks for listening to the Foundry Church Podcast. If you'd like to know more about us, visit www.foundrychurch.net.